us are having a deal. This is on? You're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Uh, some of us have to deal with colds and sickness and things like that. And uh, they're, they're trying to scare us into thinking that, yeah, we still got to worry about COVID. And, of course, Chris has COVID. And uh, other people are getting COVID. And then they have all these variants. I was reading yesterday, and they have a new variant coming out. So, I mean, there's always going to be something. And it's going to stay here. I mean, that's just something we're going to have to deal with in life. And uh, so, anyway... Uh, Hopefully, we're, we're feeling well enough. Uh, those of us who are here, we're glad to see everybody here. All right, so the title of the lesson today is called Things Change. And the primary point of this lesson is, yes, there are things that need to change. There are some things that don't change. There are some things that we don't need to change. And so that's going to be the focus of our lesson this morning as we go through this. I guess my battery's out, so we'll do it this way. All right. Seems like everything changes over time, and we, we've all seen it. We've all seen changes in our lives. I mean, I know in the 60, almost 70 years that I've been around here, I've seen a lot of changes in my life, and I can just imagine what Grandma and Brother Al there, they've seen in their lives. They've seen lots of changes. I, I know uh, my parents, my grandparents, they had changes as well. What? Your clicker. Your clicker. Okay. All right. So, sadly, many of us have seen changes in the church. And that, that's something that we, we really need to focus on. Because changes in the church should not be taking place. And, yes, there are some differences that are good. I mean, we're now using PowerPoint in our lessons, which is an aid to our teaching, which is really very effective. And that's good, which they didn't use that 25, 30 years ago. I mean, they had to use the overhead projectors. They had to use chalkboards. I, when I started out, I was using chalkboards. And uh, so, I mean, I did that. And then for a little while, I did some whiteboards. And then... Uh, but I found that PowerPoint was very effective. And so I think what's really upsetting about this, maybe I'm not connected. What's really upsetting about this is that many just don't, don't seem to care. A lot of people just don't seem to care that changes are taking place in the church these days. There's been changes in the way we worship God. There's been changes in our overall attitude towards church. There's been changes in the preaching. There's been changing changes of all sorts of kinds. And some people just really don't care. And so that's really sad when that takes place. See, we, we take caution not to change things in church or its worship service. I mean, we, we have the, the Bible, we have the outline that we're supposed to follow, we have the rules, the instructions, the commands of God in the pages of the Bible, and this is the way God wants it done. And that's what we have to emphasize over and over, because there's people out there saying, well, let's get rid of the Bible, let's not do the Bible anymore, Let, let's do our own thing. And that's what they're trying to teach, and that's what they are teaching. And people are flocking to that type of teaching. The idea of book, chapter, and verse kind of turns a lot of people off. And we at least some try to keep things the way God wants it done. And that's true. That, and that's, that's why we have different divisions in the church. Because some people want to go off in the direction of change. And some people say we need to keep it the way God designed it. And so, yes, there's division takes place. That's why the people who want change, they have great big numbers, and that's why we who decide to keep things the way God wants it, we have small numbers. It's always been that way, and it's going to stay that way. And we got to think, well, what can we do to get more people in here? Well, there's an effective method to get more people in here. It's just that a lot of times we don't think of those methods. I mean, it's very simple. We'll cover that in a little bit. We know that God does not change. 
Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. And we read in Hebrews that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, speaking of the Christ. And, and so God doesn't change. And what God has spoken should be sufficient for us. And we, we emphasize that a lot. We teach that a lot. That we don't have to have some special great big miracle of God to say, okay, here we are. We have the word of God given to us. We don't need any more. Just like the prophets of old said, God has already spoken. You don't need to see a sign or you don't need to see something great. You don't need someone coming back from the dead and warning your brethren about the eternal torment that's down there. They have Moses and the law, let them hear him. And of course, the rich man, he knew, well, well they're not going to listen to Moses and the law. And that's the problem that we face. We face that in our world. I mean, even the prophets of old, they talked about the fact that people wanted something new. They wanted something different. They wanted to see a miracle that they maybe heard their parents or grandparents talking about. Oh, I want to see one of those things. And you know what? <laughs> it might be pretty neat to see one of those things. But you know what? God has spoken. And he's not going to change. He's not going to do anything like that. So we know that the word of the Lord will abide forever. Isaiah 40 and verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God abides forever. And even Peter quoted that as well. And, and so there are some things that should never change, yet they do all the time. So that, that's going to be our focus today, is there are some things that should never change, but yet we do see changes. And Anytime you change away from God's ways, you're going the wrong direction. All right. See, we must insert here the fact that sometimes change is necessary. And that's very true. Because a lot of people are on the wrong pathway and they need to change their ways. The type of change we mention here is when you go from bad to good. There in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among, among them too we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we're dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So the change is necessary. And that's what repentance is all about. Living our lives for ourselves and then changing to live our lives for God. That Amen. is the type of change that we need to be doing. Amen. And this is the change when we leave the world and obey the gospel of Christ to become a child of God. And we don't stay like the world. We don't stay in that former condition. We're told that we're supposed to walk in newness of life. The times of refreshing, as Peter said in Acts 3.19, the times of refreshing will come. Why? When we change our ways, turn from our wicked ways. So change is necessary when we repent of our sins. I mean, it doesn't do any good to say, I'm sorry for my sins, and then continue in them. That doesn't do any good at all. And so even the, the scripture teaches that, Hebrews 10, 26. So everything we do in life transforms and changes the way we do things. Everything that happens to us on a daily basis, something changes our lives. Our health deteriorates, so now we've got to take medicine. We have to get medical equipment to help us get around, to help us move, to help us breathe. I mean, things change in our bodies, and so we have to make adjustments accordingly. And we all see changes take place. I mean, when, when the terrorists flew the planes into the, the towers in the Pentagon and tried to do the White House, I mean, things changed. I mean, the first time I went to an airport after that happened, here I am seeing armed personnel. I mean, 
National Guard troops with their rifles there, with their hand on their rifles. That was scary to me. And yet I realized that's not going to go away. And, and, and so we've seen changes. They have no-fly lists. They have things like that taking place. And things that we never even dreamed of before. I mean, with the protocols of COVID and, and things like that, now we can't do certain things anymore. We have to keep our distance. We have to separate ourselves from other people because we're afraid we might get a sickness and die. I mean, so, yes, things have changed in that way. I mean, can we do what we were once able to do? I mean, really, that depends. It depends on what it is we're talking about. Can I go to worship service and praise God? Yes. We'll always have that ability, and that's not going to change. But can I do what I did when I was 20 years old? No, I can't do that. I cannot do that. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I, I, when I wanted to call my girlfriend, I had to go into the hallway and sit in the hallway where the telephone was plugged into the wall. I mean, I, didn't, I couldn't go anywhere else. Sometimes I might try and slip into the bathroom and put the cord underneath the, and, and talk on the phone in there, try and get a little privacy. But, uh, I mean, it, it was just that way. And we had to do it that way. I mean, nowadays, let, let's look at it this way. Now we carry our phones around us with us and use wireless handsets and talk on the phone while doing our chores around the house. I mean, let, let's face it. Just about everyone in this room has a cell phone on their person or in their purse. I'm thinking there might be two people in this room that don't have their cell phone on them. Everybody else has them, and if, if not, you left your cell phone at home. And, and so, yeah, and, and so that, that's the way things are. And we talk on the phone just about anywhere we may be. You mean, maybe you remember when your car broke down, you had to walk to find a phone to call somebody. I had to do that a few times, and I'm sure a lot of you did as well. Now, young people like Rex, they, they don't even know that. They can't even understand or can't fathom that. I mean, so, I mean, that, that's just the way things are. And I'm sure many of us remember when there were only three or four channels that we could get on our TV sets. Yeah, I remember that. Then all of a sudden, the UHF channels. Wow, that was pretty neat. Three channels we could get there, too, so... So that, that increased it to seven, but uh, that was basically it. Maybe if you're in a college town, you might get a PBS channel or something like that. Uh, uh, and so what do they got now? They got thousands of channels out there now. We know that. And remember when most TVs are black and white? Rex has probably never even seen a black and white TV. I mean, he's, he's that young. But uh, for the rest of us, yeah, we remember that. We, we grew up on that. If we had one, we had one of those little bitty ones, a little 9-inch screen. Wow, that was really impressive. Then, then they got the 13-inch screen. Whoa, that thing's huge. Now, now we, we, we're not satisfied until we got an 85-inch TV in our living room or our bedroom even. So a anyway, uh, that's the way things are. And yes, we're getting that old. I mean, I, I hate to remind you folks of that. But we're not getting any younger. And we're just not. And no matter how much we try, no matter what kind of exercise we do, we're not getting any younger. We're getting that old. And we've all seen changes like that. I mean, I remember the times we, be, before I even got a cell phone. I didn't want a cell phone. I didn't want to deal with a cell phone. My wife finally talked me into getting a pager. So I got a pager. Okay. Think, kept thinking thing kept going off, so I had to keep, keep calling, getting on the phone and calling somebody. Then finally I broke down and got a cell phone. Now we've got computers on our, on our bodies that are basically better than any computer that existed back in the 50s and 60s. So, yeah. We have TVs, movies, concerts streaming onto any electronic device and we can watch them whenever we want and not be at the mercy of the broadcast station. Remember there are certain times of year you had to wait for the Ten Commandments. Okay, on Easter comes, the Ten Commandments comes on. We couldn't watch it any other time except when the broadcast station decided to put it on. We couldn't watch the ball game until 
they they decided to air the ball game. And if we if we weren't if we moved away, we couldn't get our old team to watch because they only played in a certain markets and all stuff like that. We don't need that anymore. All we have to do is push a couple of buttons, man. We've got any movie we want to watch and any any show we want to watch and any series we want to watch. It's all there for us. At just the push of a couple of buttons, we've got it. Oops, that's not supposed to be there. I don't know what's going on there. Oh, there we go. All right. See, there's much of our world that has changed that only a few of the really younger folk have no idea what it means to see change. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, they've grown up that, that way. And my young grandkids can operate any electronic device in their home, and I'm still trying to figure out how to set my, use my TV remote. And how many of y'all relate to that? Yeah, you do that. I mean, so, I mean, whenever we're having trouble with our iPad or our phone, we ask our grandchildren to help us fix the problem. And I'm not just talking about our 15 and 16 year old grandchildren. I'm talking about four year old grandchildren help us out do, oh. doing stuff like that. I mean, and I mean that, that's just what they learn. And so I'm sure many of us feel this way. So as much as we want to keep change out of the church, we have to face the reality that things have changed a great deal. And like I said, it's not for the best. And, and so our challenge is not let these things hurt our souls. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, take heed lest ye fall. A lot of people aren't taking heed anymore. They're not being cautious with the word of God. They're being very generous and allowing people to think that they're okay with God when God said what they're doing is sin. They're, they're learning to tolerate sin and put up with sin. And if a person who is involved in sin. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry. God still loves you. We want to give that message. God loves you. I mean, he's not happy with what you're doing, but don't worry about that. God still loves you. I mean, we kind of mentioned that in class this morning. And, and so in many congregations is actually going doing that because of the changes that have already taken place. They're losing their focus on their souls, and they're just going along with everybody else. See, we see many churches of Christ adopting practices they borrow from the denominations. And why is that? Well, the denominations have big numbers. Well, what do we need to do to get big numbers? Well, we need to try some things. Let, let, let's see what they're doing. See why, how they're being so successful. Well, the reason they're successful is because they've left the Word of God. They've left the Bible, and they've dismissed the Bible. See, some Christians who are trying to remain faithful are seeing some of the changes that have hurt the church in recent years. The church is declining nowadays. Why? Because they tried all these innovations, and none of those innovations worked. But yet, they, they thought they were going to work. They tried those things. See, here, here's, here's a change. Some of you might be able to understand this. I remember the days when members of the Church of Christ had a reputation for knowing their Bible better than anyone else from any other religious group. If you wanted to know something about the Bible, go find a member of the Church of Christ, and they could give you an answer straight from the Bible. It used to be that way. But folks, we can't say that anymore. We cannot say that. I mean, Bible illiteracy is so common that people are not even embarrassed that they do not know their Bibles anymore. We ask people, where do you find that in the Bible? I don't know. I mean, who are these people? See, they do not know the Bible stories. They don't know about Jonah, and they don't know about others. They do not know the Bible characters and what they did. I, mean, I was talking to some, one sister one time and talked about mentioning the name of Samson. She just, just kind of did that, you know, shaking the head and, ah, I have no clue what you're talking about. 
shouldn't be that way, folks. If we're reading our Bibles, we should know who these characters are. We should know what they did. We should know why they're in the Bible because God recognized them for doing something great or for doing something bad. A lot of people don't even know who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. But they might remember a name. Oh yeah, Hezekiah, Jeremiah, Zedekiah. I mean, we, we hear those names. Oh yeah, that's a Bible name. Who were they? I don't know. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. Try taking the opportunity to teach somebody the gospel plan of salvation. I mean, how hard is that? I mean, a fellow a long time ago, C.G. Brewer, he came up with a little formula that uses five fingers. We remember that, don't we? Yeah. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And then, of course, we need to add live faithful after that. But that, that, that's it. That's simple. And yet, we have people in the church today cannot tell a soul what they need to do to be saved. Folks, that should be embarrassing enough for you to say, well, I need to at least learn those passages of Scripture. There's only eight or ten passages you really need. And it's there in the Bible. See, we know that our culture and society has a definite impact upon the church. Worldliness has, has seeped into the church for the point where the world doesn't know anything about the Bible, so it's okay if we don't know anything about the Bible. I mean, the, the world thinks this, it must be okay. The world has accepted the Rainbow Coalition. The world has accepted all sorts of sin, and we just don't need to be talking about that. Our preacher doesn't need to be talking about homosexuality or abortion or anything like that. No, 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 that, that's not very woke. You remember that, that phrase, woke? There's a lot of wokeness going on. The only people who are woke people are people who get offended by the truth. They're the only people who practice wokeness. I mean, so our world is entertainment driven and motivated by greed. If there's not money involved, then it's got to be at least for the pleasure, the sinful pleasures, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Many preachers have changed their doctrinal stance because they wanted to please somebody. Some have Many preachers change their doctrinal stance on divorce and remarriage because their child got involved in doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And, and so they, they change. And some people realize, well, people want to have sex and more sex and more sex, so we just have to change our doctrine to allow them to have the sex with whoever they want to have sex with. That's what it's come down to. And they've changed their doctrines, their doctrinal stance. And it's not unusual anymore that this does not cause church leadership to seek ways to please or entertain the crowds. I don't know how many preachers I, I know that have been basically told, you don't preach on that subject anymore. Don't preach on that subject. Well, folks, if it's a Bible subject, it's going to be preached on. And the only ones who won't preach on that subject are those who are so worried about their job that uh, they won't preach on it because they were told not to preach on it. I think that, that's a sad testimony of any preacher who won't preach the truth. I mean, even if the truth needs to be spoken. And, that, and, and if really, if the elders are coming up saying, you don't need to be preaching on that, then definitely that's the next thing needs to be preached about. There's no question about that. When people say, I don't want to hear about hell, then we better start preaching about hell. I don't want to hear about sin. We better start preaching on sin. I mean, so, uh, but too many people are so driven by, well, we can't get numbers uh, unless we entertain people, make them happy. I mean, they're, they're almost forced to do this entertainment because they feel they will lose members or we're going to lose our young people if they do not change. The reason we're using our, losing our young people is because we're not giving them something that they can be proud of. I mean, when mommy and daddy can't stand the church and complain about the church members, complain about the preaching and complain about the song leader and complain about the length of the sermon and things like that, what are the kids going to do? Well, they don't want that. They don't want to deal with that. Mommy and daddy are suffering through that. I don't want to do that. I want to go where I can have some fun. That's why we're losing young people. 
because they don't see the dedication and the, the desire, the commitment that we have to be strong, faithful Christians. They just don't see it. Remember that the preaching of the gospel was all we needed to bring people to the Lord. You know, the power of God and salvation. That's the way it was in the first, first, first century. And this was effective years ago. When the church finally broke off from the Christian church or the disciples of Christ, I mean, they, they basically went out and they started preaching everywhere. And what did they preach? They preached the word of God. The church was growing at a great rate, a phenomenal rate. The church was growing because they preached the word of God. And then late 50s, early 60s, all of a sudden they started to stop preaching the word of God and started preaching the social gospel. And guess what? The membership leveled off and now the membership is in decline. Because people just can't get, seem to get excited about it. Now, most of our members believe that we cannot attract anyone by pure gospel preaching. And, and sadly, we have to admit, yeah, pure gospel preaching chase, chases people away. People who don't want to be serving God, it chases them away. Mm -hmm. There are some souls, though. There are some good souls out there that, yeah, that they're going to latch on to it. This is the way God wants it done. We're going to do things God's way, and there are souls that do that. And so that's why we have that. We may be small in number, but remember what Jesus said, there will be few that find it. We're part of that faithful few. And so that's the way it's going to be. So it feels like we must offer incentives of food, frolic, and fun to bring people in. And I don't know how many times I've seen this take place uh, when, when churches decide, well, we're going to build a new building and, and we just don't want to make it boring. We, we want to get ideas for people. I mean, the, the church that uh, my, my parents went to when I was very young, they sold their building in, in the middle of town, moved outside, said, well, we want some ideas. And so they, they, they published a list of all the ideas pe what people wanted. They wanted cry rooms, they wanted sound rooms, they wanted horse stables and riding paths for the people to ride horses and things like that. Work of the church, they wanted to have a daycare center and they, they wanted to have an entertainment hall. They wanted this and that. Why not just have a simple room where the preaching of the gospel takes place? And yes, Having classrooms for the kids, that, that's a good idea too. That's teaching. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And speaking of teaching, here's how most people decide what to teach their children. Of course, they know the children out there in the world going to public school and being taught there is no God and being taught all this false stuff out there, but yet we, we make the children feel happy when they can color within the lines of a picture of Noah's Ark. Well, we'll let them color a pit Noah's Ark and uh, think that's enough. Hmm, got to wonder about that. See, the Bible informs us in Acts that the preaching of the word caused the church to grow by leaps and bounds. Chapter 2, 3,000 souls. Chapter 3, 5,000 souls. After that, the numbers multiplied. And then the persecution arose. And what did they do? They went off, they tucked tail, they never said another word. No. They went out there and preached everywhere they went. And guess what? The church continued to grow. But things change. Now, I, I remember a good friend of mine back in Texas. He, he was been preaching. He's been preaching nearly 70 years now. He says, back in the 50s and 60s, it, it wasn't any problem to go walk through the streets of your neighborhood. People be sitting out on the porch. Why? Because they weren't in there playing on their computer or they're watching their TV. They were sitting on the porch. You go up, strike a conversation with them, bring up God, and you start talking about the Bible. And people were receptive to that. They needed something. 
In the 70s, though, things started changing. The TVs started getting more entertaining, providing people what they wanted. Now, all of a sudden, you can't... In, in fact, I noticed this just uh, 20 years, 20, 30 years ago. We never met our neighbors unless the power was out in the neighborhood. That's usually after a storm of some sort. Mm -hmm. You never met your neighbors. You never saw them, even if you learned their name. You might wave to them when they drive by, but they, their, their garage door would go up, they'd drive in, close the garage door down, you wouldn't see them again until whenever. Having access to people has changed. So what do we need to do? Well, we're, we're trying something here. We're going on the internet. We're, we're putting these lessons online. We're trying to help people and hopefully give people some some good things to think about so that they might consider serving God rather than themselves. I mean, that's what we're looking for. See, the changes that have taken place have been so subtle that the majority of members maybe have not even noticed it. I mean, it, it really takes a lot of thinking about this. And those who tried to warn about the changes and the dangers associated with them were labeled alarmists and usually ignored. Oh, don't listen to them. They're just a, they're, they're a self-proclaimed watchman. They're, they're an alarmist. About the only people who recognize the changes are those who ba basically left the church and maybe 20 or 30 years came back. And it was different. They recognized that. See, what they find is much different than what they left. I mean, and that, that's really a sad state because we should not have changed at all. And some of us have made it our lifelong effort not to change and people make fun of us, but oh well. I mean, we're, we're going to try our best to be serving God and do it the way God wants it done. And if that doesn't please people, what do they do? They leave. They go find some entertainment-driven place. They can have their fun. They can have their frolic. They have their food. They can have whatever they want. And they're going to be told, hey, you're okay. Don't worry about it. Just like we talked about the false teachers. There's no such thing as hell. Don't worry about hell. You can live the way you want. You're still going to heaven. I mean, that, that's a universalist approach. But that's what they do. And that's why they discount hell these days. That's why they take away these thoughts about hell. See, we must find the one way once again. And like I said, some of us have never left that one way. We must look to ourselves and our brethren and see if we have changed or not changed. I mean, let, let's face it. I, I would imagine a lot of you at one time knew your Bible very well, but you've kind of gotten out of that habit. You need to go back and start studying that Bible again and sharing that Bible with others. We need to do that. And we need to keep in mind that some changes are good, but many are not. Yes, we, we need to recognize that. And it is time for self-evaluation, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves, examine yourselves, see if you're in the faith, or do you not know this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? I mean, that, that's something we have to do, and we need an honest evaluation. Sometimes that's what the rest of us are here for. We are here to evaluate each other and let each other know you're doing a good job or there's some improvement that needs to be made. That is our duty. If we're going to help people get to heaven, that is our duty to do. And we must get back to the Bible ways. Doing things the way of the Bible. Looking for innovations and trying to provide entertainment, stuff like that. No, that's not going to cut it. The power of God is is found in the words of the gospel. The gospel, the power of God and the salvation, and that's what we need to keep teaching and emphasizing over and over. And so that, that's what we need to do, and we should never change from that. So think about this. Change. Things change. 
We don't like it sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, some things change for the better. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Some things do. But uh, when it comes to serving God, God's Word never changes. And so we have to stick with what God's Word says. We cannot innovate or add things to God's Word, that's for sure. We certainly shouldn't leave anything out. So that, that, that's the way things are. Now, sometimes we have to recognize ourselves that maybe I have changed. Maybe something about me has changed. Maybe I'm not as zealous as I should be. Maybe I'm not as familiar with the Bible as I should be. Well, folks, that is on you, and that's the choice you're going to have to make every day. Am I going to study the Bible more, or I'm just going to set it aside and watch reruns of Leave it to Beaver and Gilligan's Island? What am I going to do? I mean, so, it's your choice. And if you want to make a change for the better, if you recognize you have a little fault in yourself that you need to some change, we'll be glad to pray for you. That's what we're here for. We will help you. We will we'll help you learn these things. We're, we're willing to help people out there on the Internet. If they have questions, just send us questions, and we'll, we'll answer those questions. We'll give you Bible for what what your questions are. And if your question has nothing to do with the Bible, we'll, we'll be honest enough to tell you. So we're going to sing our invitation song. If anyone has a need to respond, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. Would you be...